Good morning, everyone. My name is Rachel Selig. I'm a staff attorney at Vermont Legal Aid in our Disability Law Project. And good morning. This is Marilyn Maheski. I also am a staff attorney with the Disability Law Project of Vermont Legal Aid. And Should we say a little bit about ourselves? Just sure, or go for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, I, as I mentioned, I'm a staff attorney with the Disability Law Project. I have been with the Law Project a very long time and um, have had a fair amount of experience in representing students and parents in special education proceedings, including in filing for due process and also representing in mediation and other forms of dispute resolution. I've also filed some complaints with the Department of Justice um, relative to special education. Um, so that's kind of my background with respect to special education matters. And I've been with, this is Rachel, I've been with Vermont Legal Aid for about five years in our disability law project for about the last three. And um, probably about half of my practice within the disability law project is also in special education, helping families advocate for themselves in IEP meetings and uh, representing in those dispute resolution processes when that does become necessary. Okay. So for our agenda today, uh, we were asked to come and talk with everyone about the recent Supreme Court decision, Andrew F. Um, and in order to do that, we're going to first spend some time talking about the history of special education law and review the previous Supreme Court case that had really kind of set the standard for what is required under the IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. That case is called Rowley. Then we'll talk about the NDREF case itself, and then we'll talk about what we think this will mean for students with disabilities here in Vermont. And I just, before we move on, I do want to make one note about terminology. Um, because of what the proper terminology was back when the earlier version of the IDE was, IDEA was passed. Um, and when Rowley, the Rowley decision came out, we will sometimes be using the word handicapped. And it's not meant to be dis, dis derogatory or just condescending. It's just that that's what the term was at the time. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there real quick. Great. So um, we thought what we'd do is give you some sort of perspective and background on special education law in the country. So prior to 1965, children with disabilities often were excluded completely from education. Um, actually, I have my, my own aunt who has a, um, uh, who's no longer living, but had, had, had cognitive impairment, uh, went to school her first day in kindergarten, uh, this was in the 40s, and she was sent home and never returned. Um, and basically never had an access to an education. So we forget <laughs> that it really wasn't all that long ago that children with disabilities were completely denied an education. In 1965, Congress became aware um, that children were being denied an access to an education and funded some grant programs. And the purpose of the grant program was to um, sort of encourage the states to develop staff, develop um, uh, curricula, just to, to start the, the path towards educating all children with disabilities. Um, it was in 1965 um, that, um, I guess, I'm sorry, yeah, it was, in, I'm sorry, I said, not in the jump to 1975, it was actually in 1975 that um, Congress then passed what is called the, what was then called the Education for All Handicapped Children Act, and that is the predecessor to what we now know as the IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, which, as you can see, was passed in 1990. Um, also, an important piece of legislation that was passed was in 1973, which was the Rehabilitation Act, which. Um, is a civil right, piece of civil rights legislation um, designed to protect individuals with disabilities. Um, what the uh, IACA um, said was uh, Congress recognized that, again, that children were completely excluded from an education or children were basically sitting idly in their regular classrooms awaiting the time when they could drop out of school. And so Congress understood that there were some children who 
uh, were completely excluded and some children who were receiving woefully inadequate educations. And that's really what prompted the um, Education for All and Handicapped Children's Act. Um, in 1990, then Congress revised and reauthorized didn't change things a whole lot substantively. Um, we're, you know, we're basically operating under the same procedural protections, uh, primarily under the same substantive standards, which we will talk about in more depth when we get to the rally and to the indirect decision. Um, the legislation was reauthorized again in 2004. There were some changes there, mostly with respect to some of the discipline provisions. Um, and then, um, of course, in 1982, the, court, the United States Supreme Court decided, decided the Rowley decision, which really, for the first time, set forth a substantive standard for what is a free and appropriate public education, which we'll talk about in a minute. And then this year, in March of 2017, the court again visited the issue of the substantive standards under the IDEA and decided the Ender F decision. So that's kind of a history of where we were and where we are today. Um, it's a very different landscape than it was pre-1965. So um, it's important also to, to remember that when we're talking about Andrew F, we're talking about a specific part of the IDEA. But the IDEA has several major requirements, and it seems worthwhile to review what those are. So first, it requires providing students who are eligible for special education with a free and appropriate public education. We do that by creating an individualized education plan, the specific plan that describes the students' present levels of performance, their needs, their goals, their objectives, the services that they'll receive. In addition, the IDEA really encourages us to educate students in the least restrictive environment appropriate to the student. So the goal really is to have students with disabilities integrated with students who do not have disabilities as much as is possible. Um, in addition, there needs to be appropriate evaluations so that the services that are put into place are the right services for that student and we have objective data to determine what the right services will be. Parent and where appropriate student participation is built into the IDEA. So parents and students are part of the special ed team for every student who has a disability. Then there are the procedural safeguards. These are the ways in which a parent or a student can um, appeal a decision by the team that they don't agree with. We'll talk about those a little bit more later mm -hmm. on. In addition, students' confidentiality is protected under the IDEA and they are entitled to transition services as they get older to start planning for postgraduate education and employment and independent living. So those are the big pieces. And what Andrew F. is really about is the question of, well, what is a free appropriate public education? And I'm going to turn over to Marilyn to talk a little bit more about that. Okay. So the court's really been pretty clear since the, the Rowley decision. Um, that free appropriate public education, which we often refer to as a FAPE, um, has several components. One, of course, is that it's free. <laughs> it's provided at no cost to the parents. Um, there is also the component of public education. And this is important to remember that um, this is that a FAPE is not insured for a student who attends a private or an independent school unless that child is placed there by the public entity, which is your school district. Um, public education can include an environment, which is the school building. It can include home. It can include a hospital. Um, it can include an institution. So public education means wherever that child is, is where the child's education needs to be provided. Um, unless it's in a private school setting, <laughs> which in Vermont, we know there are quite a number of independent schools. Where the controversy has always centered is on the phrase appropriate. And um, the court in the rally decision focused on what is the meaning of appropriate. And the court did say that um, the, the, under the statute, and the, what the court did in rally really was analyze the statutory language as it applied to the facts of the case involving Amy Rowley. And the term free appropriate public education means special education and related services. And as, as uh, Rachel mentioned, special 
education is individualized instruction that's tailored to meet the child's needs. And related services are all those other services, um, OT services, speech language services, PT services, counseling, parent training, emotional support, behavioral support. It's really all that other stuff um, that a child needs in order to benefit from their education. Um, appropriate still is not defined. <laughs> in, uh, in, and so, as I mentioned, what the court um, needed to do in both the Rowley decision and again in Andrew F. is visit what is meant by appropriate under the statutory language. Okay, so in order to think about what Rowley did and what Andrew F. has done, it's also important to think about the different steps in an appeal. So when a team, when a student needs special education, the, the IEP team is really where that's meant to happen. So the team meets and makes a decision. And ideally, the IEP team will come to consensus, right? That's always the goal is that everyone will agree on this is, these are the services the student needs. These are the related services the student needs. But we all know that doesn't always happen. <laughs> And so when a parent does not agree with the team, when there hasn't been consensus, the person from the school district, the LEA representative, gets to make a decision. And the parent who disagrees then has three options uh, to try and resolve that dispute. These are the procedural safeguards. So one option is to seek mediation. Um, mediation is always voluntary, so the school can say we don't want to mediate. A school could offer mediation and a parent could say we don't want to mediate. Everyone could agree to mediate, bring in a third party neutral who doesn't work for the school, doesn't work for the parent, to try and basically have a negotiation with this third party helping kind of figure out where the issues are and where we can solve problems. But again, even when you've agreed to mediate, you don't necessarily end up agreeing to anything during the mediation. If what's being offered and the negotiation isn't really getting to what you need, you can always say we're not agreeing to anything and walk away. The second method of dispute resolution is filing an administrative complaint. And the Agency of Education in Vermont has a fairly simple form that you can use to basically make um, a statement that you think that there's been a violation of the rules um, and ask the agency to investigate. And in some cases, we have seen good investigations, and in other cases, we have seen um, less stellar investigations. Uh, but that is a fairly mm -hmm. simple process in terms of the burden is then pushed onto the agency to look into what happens, what needs to happen, what has happened. And BFN often helps people um, file those administrative complaints and move through that process. Um, and when you file an administrative complaint, often the school will then offer a mediation. So you may end up using multiple forms of dispute resolution um, in, in any of these mechanisms. And then the last approach that a parent can take is to file a due process complaint. And with that, rather than going to a third party neutral or having the agency do an investigation, you follow a set, set of steps over a fairly short period of time to get to a hearing with a hearing officer. And some of those steps provide additional opportunities to try and resolve the dispute without actually having a hearing officer make a decision. So usually there's an opportunity for um, a resolution session or for a mediation right within um, the due process process. But if that doesn't resolve the complaint, then you can have a hearing before a hearing officer who will listen to the evidence for both sides and make a decision. And, and then, let me just interrupt. It's also important to point out that the hearing officer is an impartial hearing yes. officer. So it's not somebody who's employed by the agency of education or a school district. It's somebody who has some training in special education and um, it has a contract with the agency to provide um, that service. Yeah. Um, if, however, that hearing officer's decision is one that someone is not happy with, there are additional steps that can be taken. At that point, though, you end up in court. So those cases can be 
appealed to the U.S. District Court of Vermont, which is the lowest level of court in our federal system. And that court will review the decision and sometimes take additional testimony and then make their own decision about whether to uphold the hearing officer or reverse the hearing officer. And then again, if someone is dis dissatisfied with that level of appeal, they can go to the Second Circuit, which sits down in New York, and there a three-judge panel typically will review the case. Um, and our Second Circuit also covers New York and Connecticut, not just Vermont. And then from there, the last step that you can take, and the one that both the Rowley family and Andrew F's family took, was to ask the U.S. Supreme Court in Washington, D.C., to review the case. And the U.S. Supreme Court receives around 6,000 requests to review cases a year, and they take about 100 of those cases. So it's fairly uncommon to actually have a case heard before the Supreme Court. But that's how both Amy Rowley's family and Andrew F's family ended up becoming names of cases because they took all of those different steps. One other point I'd make is that often the court will not, U.S. Supreme Court won't take a case unless there's a split among the circuits. And what that means is that the circuit courts of appeals, perhaps in the West Coast and some of the Western states, um, have ruled one way relative to an issue and courts of appeals in other jurisdictions have ruled another way and so there's a division between interpreting the same piece of statute yeah. and that's um, and that's what happened actually in both the Rowley decision and the NDRF decision. The other thing that is important to know is it's very unusual realistically for a case to go through all of those steps. <laughs> Most cases are resolved at mediation some people do end up filing due process to bring everybody back to the table, but it's actually quite unusual in the state of Vermont for a case to actually go through the whole due process hearing. In 2016, no cases went all the way through to hearing. And in the last five years, only about 10 cases have been decided by a hearing officer in the state of Vermont. So we are often able to use these other mechanisms to resolve disputes so that we don't end up getting to that point of the process. And I think it's fair to say that there really is a preference for the alternative dispute resolution methods. One, it's a lot less expensive. It's a lot less emotional for the family and time consuming. It's a huge investment of time. Um, and the cases are very long and they can be dragged out. I mean, it's and the other thing I think that's really important is that in order to prevail in a due process case, you really need to have an expert. And what we find is that very few families, one, can afford to hire an expert or two, can even find an expert who will agree to um, do the necessary research relative to the student and what's going on in the student's um, education and then agree to um, testify relative to that. So that brings us to Amy Rowley. Amy Rowley's parents evidently decided this was an important enough issue <laughs> that they pushed it all the way to the United States Supreme Court. So Amy Rowley is a child who was born um, with uh, some residual hearing. She was considered deaf. Um, her parents were also deaf, and they used um, American Sign Language as a way to communicate within their family. Uh, Amy was also able to, leap, um, to read lips. In 1977, she was um, placed in a, in a regular education uh, kindergarten classroom, and at that time, the school district provided her with an FM transmitter, which is a, a kind of a special hearing device which amplifies um, sound. So the teacher could speak into it, other children could speak into it, and so that um, Amy was able to um, uh, to hear what was going on in the regular classroom. Um, Amy was then passed up to the first grade um, in 1978, and in addition to continuing to use the FM transmitter, um, her IEP was um, uh, amended to include an hour a day of tutoring um, for the deaf, and also she received speech therapy three times a week. And it was during this period that um, her, fa her family asked that she be provided with an um, American Sign Language interpreter. And the school district did bring an interpreter into the classroom for a period of about two weeks 
I don't remember now whether that was in kindergarten or in first grade. But in any event, um, the interpreter determined that Amy wasn't really needing the interpreter or utilizing the interpreter. So there was a decision by the interpreter in the school district that she didn't need that. Um, it's important to note that Amy was performing above average in the classroom. She was a bright little girl um, and evidently very engaged in learning. Um, and was really able to um, be successful with these with the tutoring and the therapy that she was getting and also with the amplified um, voices in the classroom. Nonetheless, Amy's parents continued to insist on her right to, under the IDEA to have access to an American Sign Language interpreter. Uh, they took the case to a hearing. Um, they applied, uh, had an administrative hearing and lost in New York State where she lives. They have a two-tiered system of um, administrative appeal. It went to the state level of appeal and she lost. Her parents then filed a complaint in federal district court. And it was in that court that she won. <laughs> um, and the court basically reversed that uh, the hearing officer's decision. Um, the school district then appealed that to the Second Circuit, and the Second Circuit Court of Appeals upheld the district court's decision. Uh, and then there was a cert petition filed to the United States Supreme Court, and the United States Supreme Court issued a decision, and it reversed the decision of the Second Circuit and uh, vacated the decision and sent it back to the district court. And what the court did is it spent a fair amount of time, are we on to the next slide? Okay. So the court spent a fair amount of time analyzing the actual statutory language and considering what Congress intended and did not intend when it passed the um, original Education for Handicap um, Act. And it was actually under the um, EHA and not under the IDEA at the time. Basically, what the court said, as I mentioned earlier, is that that the statute did in fact define a free and appropriate public education, that that means special education and related services. Um, and then it talked about what the definitions were under the statute, which is specially designed instruction um, at no cost to the parents designed to meet the child's needs um, and also related services. Um, let me put my sheet here. Um, what, base, what Rowley did basically is establish a basic floor of opportunity. And the court was clear to say that, um, that the IDEA, the, the Education for Handicapped Children's Act, did not entitle a child to the best education. It did not entitle a child to an education that was going to optimize their um, their access to an education, but that's not what was required. That the court spent a lot of time looking at the, the legislative history and said, you know, you have to remember that there was a time when children had no access to an education, and what this does is it's opening the door to an education. But once you walk in that door, you don't get the best education. So a FAPE is um, is. A FAPE is provided when the specialized instruction and related services confer some educational benefit. Um, some people might argue that that's still pretty <laughs> vague. <laughs> what is some educational benefit? And what you'll find is that um, the NDRF decision um, addresses that um, a little bit, uh, gives a little bit more flesh to that. But basically, um, your education should be reasonably calculated to enable the child to advance from grade to grade when the child is in the regular educational environment. And the court reiterated that, um, that, uh, that the least restrictive environment was an important element of um, the IDEA. Um, so children who are in the regular education classroom, if they're advancing from grade to grade and they are receiving some educational benefit, then they are receiving a free and appropriate public education. And the court determined after looking at Amy's um, ability to advance from grade to grade that she actually did quite well in the educational environment, um, that the court, that the school district was in fact providing her with a FAPE and the school was not required to provide her with an American Sign Language interpreter. So Amy Rowley has been the law of the land since 1982. Mine as well. yep. So courts have considered some other um, 
obviously some other cases since then, not uh, some of the cases that have gone to the US Supreme Court are cases that talk about who pays for the expert? <laughs> um, when do you get attorney's fees? Um, uh, some other things along that lines. But the court really, until NREF, did not revisit what um, is meant by a free and appropriate public education. But we thought what we'd do is just mention a couple of Vermont cases that had gone to the US District Court. So in 1996, there was a decision in um, Mather, um, and this was a case um, against the Hartford School District. And it was a situation where, um, it, as so many of these cases that end up in the district court, um, the issue was whether or not the school district would be, would be required to reimburse the parent for the unilateral placement at a uh, private school. And usually it's a private school where a child has a learning disability and the parent feels as though the child's not getting intensive enough services, or there might be some other uh, developmental program that the that the parent feels would be more appropriate for their child. Um, so these are, and there are some specific requirements about you know when you can uh, uh, invoke your right to make a unilateral placement and then try and seek funding from the school district. But it's not easy. <laughs> it's definitely not easy. So I want to you know make it clear to people that. Um, uh, it really turns on the specific facts of the case and the courts really analyze, well, what did the school districts do? Did they follow the procedural requirements of the IDEA? Um, did the procedural requirements interfere with the child's right to a free and appropriate public education? And then it looks at what the substantive requirements of the act are and whether or not they were violated. In the Mather decision, the court determined that um, the, the school district had provided the child with a FAPE and denied the uh, reimbursement. The court made the opposite decision in the Briere case, which was against the um, Fairhaven School District. And in that case, the court really did a, a nice analysis of what was um, what the school district had provided the child over the course of several years, both procedurally and substantively. It reversed the decision of the hearing officer and ordered the school district to reimburse the parents for the, pla the, the cost of the child's um, private school placement. Um, and it's important to note that there were some pretty significant procedural violations yes. in that case. The parents were not included in decision making. There were certain things that the school district said we simply won't talk about it at, at an IEP meeting. Um, notices weren't properly sent. So, you know, all of those added up to a denial of fate for that particular child. The St. Johnsbury Academy case is uh, was a slightly different case. So, um, and actually, the law project was co-counsel on this case. <laughs> um, we won at the district court. We got a great decision from Judge Sessions. Unfortunately, the Second Circuit reversed that decision. And this was a case. Um, DH was a, a child with a cognitive impairment who was applying to the St. Johnsbury Academy, which is an independent school. Um, the uh, St. Johnsbury School District, which was the local educational agency, was in support of the child's placement at St. Johnsbury Academy. But St. Johnsbury Academy had a requirement that a child needed to perform at a fifth grade level in order to apply for its high school program. And DH did not meet that substantive requirement. So DH was denied admission. And uh, uh, the uh, an appeal was filed relative to that or a due process hearing was filed the student lost i believe um and then that was reversed um, by the district court and as i said it was reversed again by the um second circuit and the case was vacated and that case really in <clears throat> the second circuit turned on um the fact that it was an independent school and and the obligation of ensuring that child receives a fate is with the school district and not the independent school the court also looked at the requirements under Section 504 of the Rehab Act um, and again determined that, that the child was, did not meet the requirements of Section 504, which is that you're a qualified individual. Um, and because the child didn't meet the fifth grade standard, they weren't qualified. And so, the, and the court determined that that was a reasonable, the imposition of a fifth grade standard was a reasonable. Um, requirement and so the child ultimately lost. Um, 
So I don't know that there's really anything more I need to say about that. <laughs> so since Rowley, in addition to those couple of cases that have been decided in Vermont, the different circuits across the United States have interpreted what did the Supreme Court mean when the Supreme Court interpreted the IDEA. Um, our country is split up into a bunch of different circuits, 11 circuits, and we are in the second circuit, New Hampshire and Maine and Massachusetts and Rhode Island and Puerto Rico are in the first circuit. Um, and then you can see on our map here, the West Coast is the ninth circuit and it's a very large circuit. So at any rate, one of the things that sometimes happens is these different circuits look at cases and they um, interpret what the Supreme Court means differently. And that's exactly what happened with the Rowley case. So some of the circuits, including the one that we live in in the second circuit, came up with an understanding that what Rowley meant was that special education needed to get to have a FAPE, um, the plan needed to be likely to produce progress, not regression, and then it really had to provide more than trivial advancement. Some of the other circuits, though, including the Fourth Circuit and the Tenth Circuit, where Andrew F. lives, um, described Rowley as only requiring merely more than a de minimis educational benefit. And so that has been perceived and understood um, in the world of special education law to be actually a lower standard than what the, some of the other circuits, including our circuit, came up with. And when there are, is a split like this, as Marilyn mentioned earlier, that's when the Supreme Court is going to be more likely to step in and review a case to try and resolve the difference in interpretation between different parts of the country. Because we don't want kids to have a different standard in terms of what they're going to get, depending on what state they live in. So the other big change that took place after the Rowley case was that we've had a couple of different changes in our education law, not specific to special education. So in 2004, Congress passed the No Child Left Behind Act, which was reauthorized in 2015 as the Every Student Succeeds Act. And we don't have to go into detail about what either of these laws do, other than they did require schools to administer their state assessments to all students, including students with disabilities, who are considered to be an at-risk group. And this seems, at least to us and to a lot of other legal mm -hmm. advocates who do this kind of work, a strong indicator that Congress expects our schools to educate students with disabilities, not just so they can take these tests, but so they can pass these tests. And that indicates a pretty high mm -hmm. level of expectation of students with disabilities. So that now finally brings us to Andrew F. So Andrew, or Drew as he's sometimes called, has uh, both autism and ADHD as diagnoses. He um, did go to public school um, beginning in preschool all the way up through fourth grade. And he had some pretty serious behavior challenges. He would scream. He, when he was escalated, he would climb over furniture and students. He would bolt. Uh, he had some fairly severe fears that would cause behavioral reactions. So he, he really did struggle um, with quite a bit in his school. And his parents, um, at the end of fourth grade, felt like he was not getting what he needed from his public school. The IEP that he was being offered had basically the same goals and objectives as he'd had the previous few years. And when they asked for changes, they didn't get the changes. And so they pulled him out and they sent him to a private school. Um, the private school put him on a behavioral intervention plan and provided him with academic services. And both his behavior and his academics improved. And so as with a lot of the other cases that make it into the courtroom, this was an issue of would the parents get reimbursed by their school district for the cost of that private school education, which they had initially paid for out of pocket. So um, in 2012, they filed their due process complaint and they lost uh, and they appealed to their district court and the district court affirmed the hearing officer's decision. So the parents lost again. The district court felt that although Andrew had not had immense educational growth, 
There had been modifications to his IEP year after year, and he was showing at least minimal progress. And then uh, in 2015, th th that case was heard and decided by the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals, which applied its merely more than de minimis standard and again ruled against the parents and for the school district. And at the Tenth Circuit, the parents argued pretty hard that that standard was not the correct standard and that more was required under the IDEA. And that's the same argument they brought to the U.S. Supreme Court that um, they actually argued for a substantially equal education standard at the Supreme Court. And it's important to know that the Supreme Court did not agree with them about that. Mm -hmm. The standard is still not substantially equal for students with disabilities. But the Supreme Court did provide some other very helpful language. Um, although the IDEA does not and cannot promise a specific educational outcome, any educational benefit is not enough. So this, this merely more than de minimis, de minimis standard is not gonna fly anymore. And so those circuits and district courts who have been applying that standard um, will have to change the standard that they apply. In addition, the court said that schools must offer an IEP that is quote, reasonably calculated to enable a child to make progress appropriate in light of the child's circumstances. So this continues to be very fact specific and it's really going to be about the specifics of the students and it needs to include parents and teachers. Uh, in addition, plans really need to pursue both academic and functional advancement. And IEPs must be reasonable, but there's still no requirement that the IEP be ideal or that it maximize or optimize a student's potential. The Supreme Court still has not gone that far. In addition, the court said that Rowley still holds for most students. Students who are integrated in the regular classroom should be expected to receive education that allows them to advance from grade to grade. So that's still the law of the land. Rowley has not been overturned. But the court does say that the standards is markedly more demanding than merely de minimis. And where a student can't be integrated into the regular classroom, which was really the question for Andrew, and therefore the IEP does, would not have to aim for grade level advancement, but his education must again be appropriately ambitious in light of the circumstances, mm -hmm. just as advancing from grade to grade is appropriate for most children who are in a regular classroom. Goals may be different, but every child needs to have challenging objectives and the chance to meet them. So that's the new language as of March that schools and school districts need to be following when they set up IEPs for students. Mm -hmm. um, the court did not address, address the question of whether the, the requirement about testing students with disabilities along with other, with non-disabled students change the standard at all. But what they did say is that the, the IDEA has been reauthorized several times and Congress has never acted to change the definition of free appropriate public education. And so that tells the court that they interpreted it basically correctly. <clears throat> and then if Congress thought they'd gotten it wrong, Congress could have and would have, thank you, gone ahead and made changes to that part of the law and it didn't do that. And so the court reads that as meaning, we did a good job, we interpreted this right. So what does this end up meaning for Andrew? Well, the court did not actually decide whether or not he had been receiving a FAPE, unlike the Rowley case where they made that very clear. What they did here is they sent it back down to the lower court to reconsider their decision based on what the court had decided at the Supreme Court level. And we're still waiting for that decision to come out. So mm -hmm. we don't know yet whether Andrew's parents will, will be re reimbursed mm -hmm. or not. Okay. So just to kind of put those two different standards side by side on this slide here, um, again, Rowley explained to us that FAPE is specialized instruction and supportive services that confer some educational benefit for the child that should be reasonably calculated to enable advancement with passing grades when in the regular classroom. And for those students who cannot be in the regular classroom, Andrew F. makes clear that schools must offer an IEP reasonably calculated to enable a child to make progress appropriate in light of the child's circumstances. 
So these two decisions really have to be seen as complementary, not one necessarily overturning the other. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I think one thing I would point out relative to the NDREF decision is that a lot of advocates were really quite excited about the decision and really felt as though it was changing the, the educational landscape. And I think for the children who live in those districts who were operating under the de minimis standard, it is a, it's an important decision because it definitely raises the bar for um, the educational standard for kids in those school districts, in, in those communities. Um, in our district, in, our, in the Second Circuit, in cases that were already following the higher standard where the courts were looking at uh, a child's advancement from grade to grade and integration into the regular ed classroom. Um, it, you know, we're, we're, it remains to be seen how, um, how it may change um, and how it may affect children in, in our school district. So in looking at some of the cases since Andrew F in the um, Second Circuit, um, the, you know, the, 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 there have been several, and again, most of them have been reimbursement cases that were probably already in the pipeline when NGREF was being decided. Um, but the court made clear it does that NGREF does not, the Second Circuit in considering it made clear that NGREF does not require bringing a student up to grade level. Um, but it does mean that um, that faith, that, that in order, the IEP has to provide um, services that are sufficiently tailored to allow the child to make meaningful progress. And sometimes that could require multi-years um, for a child to be provided with services to sort of bring them up to, to their peers. Um, and again, the, sec the standard in the Second Circuit is that, the, um, that FAPE is reasonably calculated to produce progress and not, con not regression. And as we said, we believe this standard is consistent with the standard that was described in NGREF. Um, and that's what some of the district courts outside of Vermont have said in their cases so far um, when interpreting mm -hmm. questions since Andrew F. has come out. Um, so does that bring a court says it doesn't have to say. So okay. this might be a good place to kind of pause and see yeah. if there are any questions. No. OK. OK. So I think we're actually going to jump forward several slides just mm -hmm. given the timing. Um, we have some examples here which will be available on um, the website mm -hmm. to take a look at in terms of some of these cases that have come out already. And what you'll see is a lot of them have either felt they don't actually have to interpret Andrew F because even if the, the lower standard was applied, the family would still win or even if a higher standard would apply, the family would lose. And so we're still waiting to see um, what these different courts will decide about what Andrew really is going to mean. Um, schools in Vermont should have been and really have been following the likely to produce progress rather than more than mere trivial and, and more than trivial and advancement standard. Um, although when Andrew F came out, Secretary Holcomb did put out a memo to school districts stating that Vermont has consistently supported a fate for students with disabilities using the morally, more, merely more than a de minimis benefit. We're not quite sure what that was about. We haven't had a chance to talk with her about that, yeah. but both Marilyn and I kind of looking back over our cases have not found one where a school district um, asserted that that was the standard that they mm -hmm. had to meet. Right. Um, and in addition, there have not been any due process or court decisions here in Vermont yet interpreting Andrew F. So again, it does kind of remain to be seen. Mm -hmm. Um, so what should we all be doing for our students right now? Um, I think this is maybe um, a helpful time to think about what our recommendations would be. Uh, our first recommendation is to really be clear about students' present levels of performance. We see a lot of IEPs where the present levels of performance are copied and pasted from IEP to IEP. Year and after year. Year <laughs> after year. And so the data really isn't current. And if the question is, what's appropriate in light of this child's circumstances, you need to be clear on what this child's circumstances are right now. So you want to be sure that the team has present levels that are actually current. You want to know what those present levels are based on. Is it classwork? Is it testing? Is it teacher observation? 
But copying and pasting from last year's IEP is a big red flag and something that you should really make sure that your team does not allow to move to, mm -hmm. to use because that's not going to be present levels of performance. Mm -hmm. It's going to be old levels of performance. Right. Um, and if the school district is providing the child with um, uh, tailored services, then the child should be making progress. Yeah. And if you know, and if the child isn't making progress, then we have to take a look at: Are the goals too ambitious, or are um, the goals not being you know addressed? Are the goals and objectives uh, not being implemented? Right. And that would certainly raise some questions about whether or not the child's receiving a FAPE. And we have absolutely seen students who have had the almost exact same goals and objectives year to year. Mm -hmm. And again, that's something that you want to really dive into with your team and find it, ask the question, what additional supports can we use to make this goal one that we can meet? Why isn't it being addressed if it's not being addressed? How do we solve this problem? And it's important to do that for all of the different areas, right? Mm -hmm. You want good present levels and good goals for the academics, for reading, for writing, for math, mm -hmm. for functional performance in terms of the social skills, personal care and travel for a lot of students, for job skills as students get older, um, computer skills, and you want mm -hmm. that based on objective data. So ideally, they're, they're tracking progress, progress in a way mm -hmm. that you have objective information that you can use to make sure you've got good goals and objectives. So one thing I see a lot on IEPs is, um, or notices, is that parents often will agree not to um, to conduct testing or to just, um, you know, it's another year, we're just gonna sort of update these goals a little bit, but we're not gonna actually redo testing. And, and I, I advise parents never to waive the right to an evaluation. I think it's really important from year to year to be looking at the data. And it's important that if, a if the school district does a Woodcock-Johnson one year, they do it the next year using the same, um, testing the same areas because that's the only way you're gonna see what kind of progress is being made. If, you, if, if one instrument is used one year and a different instrument the next year, sometimes it's apples and oranges. And so you don't have a really clear indication of of what kind of progress the child is making. Um, and very often I will see, you know, there's a triennial done and then we don't reevaluate again for three years. But if, you know, for example, if the child has a, a specific learning disability, you wanna know year to year, how much progress is that child making? And the only way, one of the best ways to measure that is really to do that objective testing. And it's also important, as Rachel said, to be looking at, um, you know, analyzing quarterly are the uh, goals and objectives being met. There are informal measures, teacher observation, you know, uh, the teacher may make their own assessments, but I do think it's important um, to, to be insisting that the school district um, take a look and repeat that objective data. Uh, and the other thing I would add about, you know, having your testing that you're entitled to is, we talked to a fair number of parents where they feel like they've been fighting with a school district for a long time, and that's really created a little bit of a trust issue with their school. And so when they get information that's based on teacher observation or classroom work, they have a hard time believing it. Whereas if you've got the objective data from some independent person doing the test who's not working with the student on a day-to-day -day basis, it's it can be it can seem more reliable. Mm -hmm. um, it may it may be entirely consistent with the classwork and teacher observation. That maybe will help rebuild that trust that mm -hmm. yes, they're really you know being forthright mm -hmm. with me in terms of what my student is learning. So. Right, right. And as you know, Rachel mentioned independent evaluation. As you uh, parents are entitled to an independent evaluation, and I know that a lot of parents that I talk to that I give counsel and advice to. I recommend go get an independent evaluation. You have the right to request it. You don't have to state your reasons why you want it. Uh, uh, sometimes the school district will say, well, let's just move up the, eval the triennial or let them do a reevaluation and that's fine. Um, and I imagine that VFN recommends often about getting an independent evaluation, but I think uh, sometimes that's a really critical piece and I think it's perhaps underutilized as a tool for just measuring and assessing how's your child doing. Mm 
Okay, some additional recommendations. We want to be sure that when IEP goals are written, they are SMART goals. So SMART is an acronym for specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-based. So a goal that says my student will improve in reading is not specific, measurable, relevant, or time-based necessarily. So a lot of schools will use um, systems so that you have kind of a grade level of what, or a letter level of what level your student is in reading, for example. And so if the student is currently at level C and you want to get to level G by the end of the school year, you'll also have some interim goals to see how they're making that progress. So that's very specific. It's measurable because there are objective tests that we can use to determine what the grade level of reading is. It's relevant if the student is behind in reading. And if it's you know, the goal is to do that by the end of the IEP year, it's, it's time based and ideally it's set up to be to be attainable. Um, as Marilyn said, and as I've said, use those progress updates that you get um, during the school year to make mid-year adjustments. Although an IEP team only has to, has to meet once a year, the team can meet more frequently. You can always request an IEP meeting if you're getting information that suggests that services are not, not enough for the student. And focus on whether the student is making progress and how to achieve progress where it's been minimal. What additional services can be provided and is this actually a circ circumstance where a different setting may actually be needed? So those are our major recommendations, mm -hmm. and I think it's time for questions, and it does look like we have one here. How do I make that a little bigger? So that ah, okay. So this question is, is the U.S. Aid Department of Education expected to issue guidance to the states on NDRF? Uh, I don't know that we know the answer to that, although I believe rumor has it they've indicated that they may be. Um, so I don't think we know the answer to that yet. Okay. There are some other questions here. Um, uh, one is... Um, a parent, if a parent strongly disagrees with the school's assessment of my son's potential, and that disagreement results in an IEP that isn't as robust as it should be, what can I do? Um, so specifically what you can do is one, you can, um, if, this, if you and the school district have a disagreement, you can ask that the school district provide you with written notice of its decision. So it needs to explain to you why it's made that decision. That's considered a form seven. Um, and sometimes that can be very helpful. Um, if you probably could also request an independent evaluation. So what that will do is reassess the child, um, depending on what tests were used previously or what instruments were used to test your child. The independent evaluator may use the same test depending on when they were done, um, would add some other tests to it. Um, so I think that's the most important thing is to get an independent evaluation. The school district is required to provide the independent evaluation. Um, they may have some restrictions on who you can use, um, but um, they are required to provide the independent evaluation. And if they don't feel as though they need to do that, then the burden is on them to file for due process. Um, so that's the first step, get that independent evaluation and bring that evaluation back to the, to the IEP team. Here, I'll let you answer the second question. Okay. So our next question is, uh, my daughter's evaluations recommended a certain reading program that her school has decided to not use because of the expense. Uh, what can I do when I see that her reading program it, progress is minimal? So. Um, you don't get, so there, this is a kind of a complicated question because on the one hand, you don't get to dictate to the school what reading program they're gonna use. A lot of parents of students with a specific learning disability really want their school to use an Orton-Gillingham approach. And some schools will do that, other schools won't. But when the question is, if, if the reason they put in the Form 7 is because of the expense, that is something that mm -hmm. you can and should appeal because the rules do not allow the school to make a decision based purely on mm -hmm. the expense. And that's a fairly straightforward rule violation. So I think you can, of course, always ask for an IEP team meeting to discuss it again. 
Um, you can ask for a mediation to deal with it. But this is the kind of straightforward rule violation mm -hmm. where an administrative complaint may actually be an appropriate response in terms of um, kind of trying to, to nip this in the bud early on. However, it sounds like in this case, the, the daughter has actually had this other reading program and progress is minimal. That would suggest that mm -hmm. perhaps she's not receiving FAPE with this mm -hmm. reading program. And so coming back to the team now that you've got data that shows she's not making progress may change the team's mind and get them to use a different program because this one has not provided the progress that was anticipated. Um, another question we have here is I filed an administrative complaint and never heard back from anyone. What should I do? So this contemplates that a parent has filed an administrative complaint with the agency of education um, and that the agency presumably has not responded. Um, the agency under the IDEA has an obligation to investigate and respond to administrative complaints that one of the things we really didn't mention is because we talk a lot about school districts, but the state also has an obligation to ensure that children receive a free and appropriate public education. So the state is not relieved from its obligation. If the LEA isn't going to do it, the state needs to do it. So I think as a practical matter, um, you can get back to the administrative complaint, the, the agency of education say, I haven't heard from you. Um, you can also talk to VFN and ask for their assistance in contacting the, um, following up with the Agency of Education. And you can also um, get in touch with Vermont Legal Aid. And at the next page, you will see <laughs> our contact information. So our intake system is such that you would need to make a call to our um, Vermont Law Help hotline, and they will do an intake, um, and then that intake would um, very likely be responded to by an advocate from the Disability Law Project. Um, so I, it definitely, if uh, you're not getting a response, I would follow up. Those are That's really important. Okay, the next question. Um, my son is in high school, and his transition plan is weak and not based on any transition assessments. I'm very concerned about what his life will be like after he graduates. What should I do? Well, first, contact his case manager at school and ask for them to set up transition assessments right away. Um, this is something that whoever the transition coordinator at school should already have probably done if he's in high school. Um, and if that's not been completed, that needs to be done um, quickly. Um, Second, I think it's important to remember that if a student needs special education, they don't necessarily have to graduate from high school in exactly four years. And so a lot of students who need special education are going to need additional time because they continue to need special education services. And they can potentially stay in school up until the semester where they turn 22. Or their 22nd birthday, or their depending 22nd on the school birthday. district. Yes. Um, <laughs> And so if there really hasn't been any transition work done or any transition planning, that in and of itself may be a reason to continue receiving services from school so that the student can develop job skills, independent living skills, mm -hmm. and potentially look into doing something like the, the, some of the college programs that are out there at our public universities now for students with disabilities or in going to, to college um, in a regular college program. Right. That may be an option as well if transition planning is done right. And I find that some school districts are um, pretty quickly turning kids over to the developmental disabilities agencies. And I think that's really problematic. I think that if you have a child who could continue to benefit from an education, the fact that the school district is saying, oh, well, you know, he or she's met the graduation requirements, there may be situations where you really want to push back on that and say, no, my child is entitled to an education until their 22nd birthday. Um, and earning credits is not the only consideration right. that schools are allowed, can use when they determine whether a student is ready to graduate who's on an IEP. So just being told, well, they've met the graduation requirements, if the student still needs special education services, those can continue. So it's, do you want us to keep going? We have a few more questions here. Okay, okay. great. So we have a question that asks, um, um, I asked my daughter uh, whether or not she received her OT and speech language services, and she frequently says no. How can a parent um, confirm with the school that she's actually receiving all of her related services? This is a tough one, isn't it? Because school districts often do not communicate um, 
uh, on a daily, weekly, or even monthly basis whether or not a child is receiving all their related services. I think it's something you bring up at an IEP team meeting and you ask, is my child receiving services? And, it, and those services are going to large, probably be billed to Medicaid. And you can, you know, if you really have a trust issue where you just feel as though your child's not getting what's um, being required, you know, you can you can get confirmation from billing. But I think the first place is to ask for, uh, at an IEP team meeting and to demonstrate. You know, show me the attendance records. Show me something that indicates that my child is actually showing up. And there may be times when, you know, the person's out or they're missing occasionally because there's some other special going on. You know, I think that's probably um, pretty common. But if it's happening on a consistent basis, then you probably want to be talking to the school district about possibly finding a different time slot here to ensure your child is, um, is getting the services that they're actually in the IP and that he or she is entitled to. So I think we'll take one more question um, because we are right at 11 o'clock. Thanks, everyone, for sticking with us. Um, this question is, what do you think about independent schools in Vermont who act as the local public school not accepting all students? Is this legal? I want my son to go to St. Johnsbury Academy, but they won't accept him because he is di of his diagnosis and IEP. Um, I think that what I would say to this family is to call Vermont Legal Aid and get individual advice from us. Uh, it sounds like this is a pretty specific um, question. And I would say that Maryland in particular has been doing a fair amount of work on some rules that the Agency of Education has been looking at in terms of regulating the independent mm -hmm. schools like St. John's Bay Academy, who do effectively act like the local public school. Um, yeah, and, and I think it's an ongoing issue. Yeah. Um, certainly the State Board of Education is looking at this issue. It's a pretty hot button issue at the moment. Um, uh, you know, our position is, is that children are under, 50, under Section 504 of the Rehab Act entitled to access to um, the, the independent school environment. And uh, the independent schools should not be discriminating against children with disabilities on the basis of their disability. That's yep. a clear violation yeah. of the law. Um, and I and so that that's our view. Certainly, if that's happening, we would like to hear from you. Yes, please call us. <laughs> and I'd like to thank Marilyn and Rachel for the webinar today, and remind everybody that this webinar is going to be archived with more than 90 webinars that we have on our YouTube channel, and also our website. Our website is VermontFamilyNetwork.org, where we have a variety of resources. We encourage anyone who ever has a question, we're here to help and to listen. So please give a call and ask to speak to a family support uh, consultant. Our toll-free number is 1-800-800-4005. And have a great day. Thank you.